Hello everyone, I'm excited to be here today and I'm absolutely sure we're going to have a swell time today. My name is uh, Usaze Agedo and with me is Ada Obi Ugu. Yes, we are going to be facilitating today's session. I want to welcome you all to Engage Africa Foundation 2021 Festival. Our theme this year is A Promising Future. And we have three amazing panelists with us today. And they're going to be the ones talking with us and discussing the issue we have or we're going to be discussing today. I'm just going to read a brief bio of each one of them as I introduce them. So our first panelist is Jennifer Uchendu. Jennifer Uchendu is a Nigeria eco-feminist, a sustainability communicator, a climate activist, and founder of Sustivite a social enterprise that makes sustainability actionable and fun for the Nigerian youth. You're welcome, Jennifer. We're happy to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you so Our much. Second... I get it. Okay, thank you. Our second panelist is Dr. Wenoms. Our mission is to find hope in all places by radiating love and light. She's an early career researcher at Leeds Beck University, UK, our work is centered on nutrition, clean water and sanitation, and hygiene, and also reducing inequalities. She uses our platform. She enjoys piloting development projects in health, education, and the environment in schools and communities across Nigeria. She serves as a global health mentor for students and youth professionals, and a squeaky career advocate for young people. She uses a platform called Moments with Dr. Wenoms to empower young people. You're welcome, Ma. We're happy to have you here today. Thank you very much. Our third panelist, Edwin Namakanga. Edwin Namakanga is a climate activist from Uganda. He graduated from Makarere University in 2019 with a Bachelor's of Science in Population Studies. Edwin is the organizer of Friday Climate Strikes and a graphic designer at Rise Up Movement. Edwin is striking because he wants people to understand that climate crisis is happening now and we need climate justice now. Edwin, you're welcome to the panel discussion today. Okay, once again, we're happy to have you all here. And without further much, uh, without much ado, we'll go right to our questions and we'll dive into the session. In this panel today, we are going to be highlighting the importance of caring for the environment in order to improve health and the various initiatives in Africa working to ensure a better environment for us all. My first question will be for Jennifer. Jennifer? Jennifer, my first question is, how does your initiative, Sosti Vibes, Contribute for caring, contribute to caring for the environment, to improve health, ecofeminism, and also what challenges have you faced in doing? Okay, while we wait for Jennifer, I'll go ahead to ask Dr. Winoms. Dr. Winoms, how does your initiative contribute to caring for the environment, to improve health, and also the challenges you have faced in doing this so far? Okay. Uh... Good day, everyone. It's nice to be here. Thank you, Usaze. So um, I'm kind of too versatile and I'm not in one place. So um, <laughs> we run a park, a, a mangrove park. I'm sure you know about the mangroves. So we run a, yeah. a mangrove park called Fakop Mangrove Park. It's in the Niger Delta region. Yeah. So that is like a green space where we invite people to just come and relax, to come and so we did not cut the mangroves. We just left it the way it was. We just created pathways and wow. kind of imputed things like museum, royal museum, because it's in a, um, a very historic place in Ishekiri land in Nigeria. So we have museums, we have sitting areas, we have a mangrove trail across the white and red mangroves. So that's one way where my platform uh, kind of uses to improve health because we know that from the research we have on partnership with um, universities, we realize that the mangrove actually helps with low, um, respiratory problems. So oh, a wow. walk around the trail takes you about 20, 25 minutes. And uh, people have come back to tell us that, oh, I had 
um, issues with my lungs. I had breathing problems, but walking through the park actually relieved me, actually helped wow. me. So that's wow. one way. And then the teas we make from the mangrove, the mangrove itself, we call them in our native language, Ibadudu. Uh, so mm. what we make from that, it actually helps with malaria, with um, especially anything that has to do with fever, but particularly malaria, it helps with it when you mix it with all other trees like guava, plantain. So that's one way where my platform does that. Another way is in terms of nutrition, trying to see how you connect nutrition with um, with and the environment. So farm to table. So kind of having mm. farms, um, suggesting or promoting the idea of farm to table where you have, you plant cassava, you plant okra, you plant that. So in the last five years, we've been doing that. At a point, we involved young girls uh, where they could plant um, vegetables, pumpkins. And when they sell it, the money goes into education for either maybe stationaries or whatever it is that we could. So, yeah. Wow. Farm to table, the mango park. What challenges have you faced in doing that so far? A challenge is people don't understand why you have green space. So you have problem with community wanting to sell off the land or fighting you. So there's a case of being at the court for more than nine years going because they feel why should you leave an expanse of land like that? They want to sell it. And then also people say, I go to Dubai, I go to this place. You don't have zoo, you don't have animals. So there's a challenge of people understanding what a green space means and how it okay. improves their health. Okay, thank you very much. That's quite insightful. Uh, Jennifer, I don't know, are you with us? Jennifer, yes, I there? am, sir. Yes, I am. Okay, uh, welcome back. So I'll just ask, I was asking you, uh, what does your initiative today currently do to, to sustain the environment, uh, health and ecofeminism and the challenges you have faced so far in doing that? Okay, hmm, that's a very wide question. <laughs> uh, essentially, Susti Vibes um, you know, works with young people in Nigeria, uh, making the idea of sustainability, the SDGs relatable and actionable to other young people. So it's a lot of advocacy and um, youth-led community actions. So like tree planting initiatives, like um, going to schools to engage young people on the SDGs, you know, recycling, solar, and all of that. But at the same time, working with a theory of change that you need to empower and inform women while you know working towards saving the environment and that's where ecofeminism really comes to play mm -hmm. the fact that you know for too long we've had um, less and less women on the table in, when it comes to decision making about how our environment is protected so it's um, advocating women in these spaces advocating more you know female-led action because at the end of the day women you know are more prone to think about their future think about about their children and would want to you know protect the environment and when it comes to our health really everything we do for the environment is really for us at the same time yeah, so you know tree planting each time we go for tree planting and people say, oh, is this just for climate action? We're like, climate action is for us, it's for human beings, <laughs> is that we, is, we're we trying to, you know, have a place on this earth and really sustain yeah. the planet. And of course, you know, tree planting has immediate benefits beyond the nutrition that our indigenous um, trees will give us. But that filtration system, you know the difference between a place that has a shade and a tree and places that don't. And there are lots and lots of studies to back that, you know, being in green spaces, just as Dr. Williams has said, and um, just being around nature helps to improve, you know, improve health. There's this project we worked on as far back as 2019, when we were advocating nature and green spaces as a way to mm. overcome a lot of mental health challenges that young people were facing. We say, you know, come out to, come out, go and have a green bath, you know, in, in a Lufasi <laughs> forest or something, you know, come out and have a picnic in nature. Because at yeah. the end of the day, we are not, you know, apart from nature. We are really a part of nature. You know, the, the oxygen we get, we're getting from our trees, you know, 
there's a whole ecosystem where humans are very much in, in, in a part of. So we're not doing nature a favor. I think it's even reverse. Is nature really helping and sustaining yeah, yeah. us, ensuring that we live uh, longer and better on this earth? So yeah, that's a, a big picture of what we do. Okay, so what challenges have you faced? That was the second phase of the question. Challenges well, you definitely. Challenges. Sure, thank you. Um, a lot very, very related to what Dr. Wareham said. I think it's stereotypes. And it's it's interesting because Africans, we weren't always like this. We used to be, you know, very embracing to nature, but it's a bit different now as modernity and, you know, development as it's where it's coming to play. Well, it's the stereotype, you know, you're telling people, oh, you need to stop littering, for example, and you're letting them know the relationship between that plastic that goes into the ocean microplastics and how it comes back to their health and they're like what are you saying how is this my problem you know they're like they are not being so i'm going to continue littering so it's continuing to educate and raise awareness so the ignorance level the culture the cultural stereotypes are there and they come up as barriers a whole lot. And I think secondly, is when you then hear these solutions and initiatives from young people, it becomes more difficult to penetrate. You now need to make a case. You need to sort of create a seat at the table to say, we are demanding for nature-based solutions for our environment. We're demanding that our trees not be cut down. So for you to really penetrate those power holders, the government, people who think that, you know, they'd rather cut down a tree to set up a tree or construction, is making that case. And coming from young people, it's always difficult. Things are obviously changing with like the global youth um, strikes and other things happening but we know it's difficult we know that we're up against really really powerful institutions who don't see things the way we see them who don't think that you know protecting our future right now is the is the way to go who put capitalism you know beyond um environmental <laughs> protection so those are the issues those you know those are the challenges that we we have to deal with every single day Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. That was quite uh, exclusive and <laughs> quite interesting to listen from that point of view. So, uh, Edwin, a uh, question is for you. Similar question. What, what, what are you doing? What is your initiative doing to for the environment? I know you're in the climate uh, space uh, area. And also on your Twitter, we saw that you say you're inspired by Vanessa Vash, uh, Greta Thunberg. So we want to understand how they inspire you. And you can tell us about your work on the Fridays for Future Climate Strikes. Um, hello, everyone. Greetings hello. to you all. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hello, hear me? Hello, Edwin. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Greetings to you all. My name is Edwin Namakanga. I'm a climate activist from Uganda and a graphics okay. designer at Rise Up Movement. I was inspired by Vanessa and Naka and Rita Thunberg to do my climate activism because uh, I wanted to, to, to make sure that this the message reaches out to all the people down there. And right now, I can see there is uh, at least a change in the in the climate action, at least. So um, about that question you told me about, you asked me. Yes. Um, we see that human beings link together, and every time people harm the environment, they cause environmental problems, and these problems evolve damaging the changes in the environment, many of which of these changes in the environment are irreversible and affect our health as human beings. Hello? Yes, I can hear you, Edwin. Okay, uh, a bad environment indirectly, indirectly is increasing health problems such as anxiety, depression as as Dr. Dr. Wilson and Jennifer talked about, and also all these problems are the health problems are caused due to due to the 
extreme weather events like floods, drought, and these also these events they cause maternal and child health. They lead to maternal and child health. Like uh, for instance, in Uganda, uh, like there are places where swamps. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. I've been carrying. Okay, in Uganda, there were swamps and in catchment areas for water. But when the population increased, uh, the people encroached these areas. And now that water is not, yet, is not managed well. So it leads to uh, flooding. And this flooding it also leads, leads to waterborne diseases like diarrhea, cholera, dysentery. And this also affects the health of us like human beings. Okay, Edwin, thank you. You, you, didn't, you didn't talk about how uh, Vanessa Vash and Greta Thunberg inspires you. How they inspire you? Oh, okay. Uh, it was in uh, around 2019. I used to see Vanessa and uh, Greta Thunberg uh, like carry placards having messages of climate strikes. Like, and then I noticed that uh, these things we are ignoring them, but in the near future, going to our as we as a, a be able to raise a voice to reach out to the leaders who tend to give us a deaf ear on okay. issues concerning the climate. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Edwin. Thank you. Okay, Edwin. So on the next question, I would like to ask you, Edwin. Could you please tell us the influence of climate change on health and in what no. ways the people in government? I said, could you please tell us the influence of climate change on health? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. And in what ways are the people in government working towards ensuring climate justice? As we know that some efforts have been made in the past, like the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, and the rest. So we want to hear from you, the efforts, the people, the effects on health and the efforts the government are making towards climate justice. So uh, the people, like climate, like let me say, for example, in Eastern Uganda and Western Uganda, the people are experiencing uh, landslides and also floods. And this ends up affecting the health of uh, the people like people lose their dear lives and also their properties are destroyed. So they end up, they end up being affected. Like they die because of, due to famine. And this is also caused by, uh, let me say, uh, the floods. So uh, this issue, uh, the government in, uh, the government has, has not yet like uh, come up to support these people. Like, let me say, giving them uh, an alternative, a place where to go and maybe they seek settlement because these people are settling on the slopes of, uh, of Mountain Elgon, if you know it in, uh, in Eastern Uganda. But when they are okay. affected by these floods and landslides, they end up being, uh, Okay, they, they lose their properties, but then after to in that same place. So I think the government needs to come up with a strategy to uh, to at least shift them to better places, and at least they live um, hilly areas and mountainous areas. Okay, 
so the government are the government they are providing like a camp where these uh, displaced persons stay. But you're saying they need to do more, right? Okay, thank you very much. More because uh, it's in Africa. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Edwin. My next question goes to Dr. Wenom. Dr. Wenom, are you there? Yeah, yes, I am. Okay. Dr. Wenom, we've seen that flooding is a very, very serious environmental issue. It has led to so many harm to death, injuries, drowning, especially in the region where you work. We've seen that uh, flooding is affecting food security and, of course, leading to malnutrition, people being eventually infected with diseases, food and waterborne diseases. So we've seen that flooding is a great issue in the Niger Delta region of Nigeria. I am asking you, Dr. Wenoms, please, what efforts are being made to address the problem of flooding in your region? Oh my, oh my. Um, I think some days ago, I was, I am part of a community kind of WhatsApp group and they were commending the, in quotes. Okay, so we have like clusters of communities and we have like representatives from the kings who are in charge of everything, really from government down the, to the community. And they were thanking him for, <laughs> they were thanking him for the drainage. I mean, that makes sense because <laughs> In the last five years, every year they keep repairing that drainage. And <laughs> the drainage is the problem. So every year, Delta State comes up and says, oh, there's flooding. Oh, there's flooding. Oh, We're going to do this. So they just do um, oh, makeshift. They, 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 they do makeshift words. <laughs> Next year, they'll start again. What? So that's how my government is Next doing year, it. They'll start again. That's how my government is doing it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so when so they were like, uh, no, it's, yeah, it's not a What did he say? What did he say? Okay. Do you wanted to ask a question. Hello. Yeah, she was no, saying. She was saying that when they congratulate, they go, next year they do the same thing. Yeah, so like, like when they congratulate, next year they do the same thing. Yes. Like yeah, so, yeah, so we are in a circle. So, yeah, so we are in a circle. So, so I think I'm, there's an echo. Yes, there's an echo. That's why. So, I'm, so I think there's an echo. Yes, there's an echo. That's why I'm. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, okay. And I, ideally, ideally, with the ideally, connections ideally, we have with the government and the community and the kings and the chiefs and all the representatives, one is to call, go back to the drawing board and say, where did we get it wrong? Where did we get it wrong? In terms, for, for instance, they blocked all the drainages. They built houses on the drainages. So what are we going to do? What alternative solutions do we have or can we provide for ourselves to sort our drainages out? Then drainages, you now have to come back again with Jennifer saying advocacy, talking to people. People don't understand why they should not throw dead into the gutters, into the drainage. So everybody's throwing everything. So get mm -hmm. everybody involved. And I still feel maybe school is failing. Religious organizations need to wake up. There was a project I did recently and in front of the church had the largest clubs, gutters, everything full. And I asked them, it's a very popular church in Nigeria, like very famous, one of the strongest, oldest churches. And the question I asked is, should the Allah by that is to pass this place? He doesn't know that. <laughs> there's this water is causing a whole lot of problems. So government needs to come back. The way they the way my the dynamics I see it in my region, they need to harness that and go back and say, what do we need to do? What alternative solutions? How do we do mass civic education? How do we use religion? The way Africans are so tied to religion, how do we use religion to fight this flooding? Because the flooding keeps com coming back. Asaba, 
it's a flooding it's always flooding it's always flooding it's ever flooding and nobody's doing anything so let's go back to the drawing board let's see what we can do what are the alternate solutions because we'll keep having sickness we'll keep having vegetable bone disease so education and finding alternatives okay thank you very much Dr. thank you i think there's an echo so if you're not talking you can just mute your mic i kept hearing an echo Okay, so my next question, I'll be going back to you, Jennifer. Yes, so I know when we asked your first question, I noticed you scratched the surface of uh, ecofeminism. I know you also scratched the first surface of uh, climate. So we want to give you the time now. Our audience is going to be listening and they say, okay, what's what ecofeminism? What's the intersection between environment and feminism? And what impact does that have on a women's head? So if you can throw more light on that aspect, we appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So basic, basically, ecofeminism is just mostly a branch of feminism that is focused or that is sort of hinged on the fact that both the environment and women have been marginalized and oppressed for too long. Mm -hmm. And it's basically saying that if we have to protect the environment, we must also empower and uplift our women. Mostly because when you think of people or the, the population who, who's disproportionately affected by issues of climate change, issues of pollution, it comes back to the women. Um, you know, um, we'll say, give an example of flooding and how it comes with waterborne diseases. And when you think of when that happens in a community, the women have to then look after their children. However, if there was a community meeting or something where these women were highlighting the fact that the rains are coming, we need to do something about the floods because it's going to impact our children, it's going to impact our food security. It will be taken more seriously if women had that seat at the table. And so that's why ecofeminism is sort of focused on ensuring that women are you know, capable, they are knowledgeable, they're empowered to make decisions that really impact their life. And it goes beyond the environment it also looks at even them them um, you know they as women their bodies having rights to their bodies and the decisions they want to make about their future so it's looking at you know the environment and how you know for too long we neglect the environment we don't know the value that nature and the environment really feeds to us it's the same way you know women they give birth to like the makeup of the population we are so essential it's looking at women and the role they play in the ecosystem and how they can really be more um more impactful more valuable in protecting the environment so really as an ecofeminist in nigeria i'm i'm looking for opportunities where more women can be part of climate change decisions at both global and local level and more women can know about sustainability and sustainable development and be you know work as volunteers work as you know actors major actors rather than being observers that just you know take whatever decisions comes back but they need to be there because because we need that gender lens, that female lens to how these decisions are being made, to what solutions come up. And you know, globally, this is something that has also been seen. Women are now being supported when it comes to you know, environmental projects because quite frankly, they do it better. You know, they are more <laughs> sort of, um, they, are, they are better, um, what's the word, intentional and strategic because it goes beyond money now. It's like, this is a fight for my child's future. You know, protecting the environment is how I'm sure that my child has a place in this world and that they won't be, you know, victims of some environmental disaster. Mm -hmm. So there's that connection, you know, that maternal connection uh, to, environment, to the environment that is really important. Some of the projects I've worked with within that space beyond the policy angle is even looking at issues of FGM, 
because mm. when you start with FGM, you're already sort of oppressing and suppressing a, a young girl from a very young age, saying that, you know, you don't have a right to your body. These decisions are not yours to make. And that's how it flows through, whether it's in the environment and whatever she ends up to do, that stereotype and mindset that, you know, that women are to be conquered, that women don't have, you know, absolute control over their bodies and the decisions they make. So it's all intertwined and is ensuring that we support enough young girls you know to to make these decisions and to 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 have to really have the knowledge needed you know to advance in life and to drive sustainable development because what's the point when you have half of your population oppressed it doesn't make any sense you're not carrying people along and there's no inclusion there oh thank you very much jennifer uh, i really liked when you talked about uh, there are less women in the decision-making space and how you're, you're working towards encouraging that. I remember seeing a post on uh, Instagram about a lady that was invited to, for this Ministry of, Educa uh, Ministry of Environment, they had a policy meeting and she was invited and she was, she was actually happy because that was like an opportunity for her to, to speak, I guess, in the space. So let me use this word, it's as an eco-feminist, so there's an opportunity for her to speak and actually writes a name in the, in the stones of time. Uh, another question for you, uh, Jennifer. I know I saw, your pro I saw a tweet from Susty Vibes, uh, on, uh, yeah, a tweet on a community tree, community trees project. So I don't know, is this yeah. intertwined or so? Is it also a way to encourage tree planting in communities or what? Sure, definitely. So the community trees is basically a community-based tree planting project that was done in Lagos and Abuja in Nigeria. We thought that it wasn't enough to, you know, just mobilize our volunteers to go and plant okay. trees. It was essential that the community takes ownership of that tree planting okay. project. That's how you they will look after it. They need to, you know, yeah. it has to be their own. So um, that's why it was sort of community based. And that was done side by side advocacy. With advocacy, oh. you know, we engage the leaders, you know, just as Dr. Williams said, the priests, the, the um, you know, imams, literally people who were influencers in the community to talk about trees. And in that, in that process, they even reminded us that, oh, we used to have this tree, you know, we used to really mm. cherish these trees, but you know, they've been cut down, so much has happened. Now we, we're, we are getting this opportunity to have our seedlings and plants. So it's basically just giving communities rights to um, protecting the environment in ways that work for them. So we saw them asking for, oh, we like coconut tree, you know, we check, can a coconut tree work here? If it's possible, we're happy to provide them with those trees. Because when you work hand in hand with community, you're sure that, that the sustainability of the tree goes on, that, that those trees will leave because, you know, women would you know they would um, apportion their children to go and water on this day you know that kind of process so that was what we did with community trees and we're able to plant 5,000 trees in both states working with wow. the community mostly wow. in rural areas but of course you know all of these um, actions we had to also work with the government the park and agency um, the park yeah. and gardens agency in both Abuja and Lagos really supportive ensuring that they know that we're planting these trees so that we, we don't hear that, oh, you know, this government has gone here and they've cut down these trees or these seedlings. We needed them to, we needed to get their approval, ensure that the sites where we're planting were also approved and they were fine for planting. So that was the big picture. And then we worked with the British High Commission in Nigeria for that project. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one thing you said, uh, ownership. So involving mm -hmm. the community gives them the opportunity to, to, to play a role. It gives them a sense of ownership. They know this is our, this is our, thank you. So what statement can you have for our, what word or what statement do you have for our audience today listening to you? Uh, what word of encouragement do you have to them to, uh, for, in, for them to include sustainability in their daily, uh, their daily life? Well, I guess, I get pe people people really want to be sustainable true and true but they mostly don't know how or they don't know how best and one thing where where uh, one school of thought we're driving with sustainability is uh, with susty vibes is for you to try for you to you know keep doing what you can do think about 
whatever action you're doing, does it impact the environment negatively? Can I avoid it? Because some issues are unavoidable given where we're living. If it's unavoidable, if it's avoidable, then definitely if you can use alternatives, if you can choose not to litter and hold your plastic in your hand until you get to a bin, make those conscious efforts. Because at the end of the day, we're not separate from nature. I guess that's the major statement that we're not apart from nature. We're actually a, a huge part of nature. You know, whatever, when we throw that um, bottle out, we're, we're hurting ourselves at the same time. So people really need to understand that it's a whole ecosystem. You know, what goes in sort of comes out and it's garbage in, garbage out. When we put in that garbage to, to the environment, we get it one way in the air we breathe, the food we eat. So it's really essential that we're more conscious of how we live every day and how we take care of ourselves through the environment so that would be you know my major statement and encouragement thank okay. you thank you very much jennifer uh next question will go to dr Winoms. dr Winoms, please we would like to have a parting word from you a word to encourage our audience watching this on how they can create awareness and join the advocacy train for environmental protection. Okay, I, I think okay. I love when you talk about sustainable. I don't know why it's echoing there. I don't know what why it's echoing there. First of all, I would say, would say we, need we, need we need education. We need education as much as possible. Let's as much it down as possible. in our language, Let's whether it's pidgin, whether it's Swahili, whether whatever it is, whether we need to break it down. Because sometimes when you're talking about climate action or climate change, or maybe you're even talking about environmental education, so they are like, what are you saying? So we need to start with the simplest of all education maybe, yeah, about maybe about, about um, using of plastic. You know, just that environmental sanitation we used to do in Nigeria, where everybody used to be very serious about it. Let us get back to that. Let me coin from um, Jennifer's word. Let us have that vibe to keep our environment, you know, the way we want it to be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's my parting word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. So, Dr. Wenoms, you're saying basically education is the key. <laughs> After all, it has always been the instrument by excellence for national development. So, if we actually need that development, we need the advocacy. Education is important. Also, we can I think we can also think of. Uh, using club meetings, because through education as a vehicle, which you've just mentioned, then uh, students' pupils will be taught. It could be included in their curriculum. I guess that was, that's what you meant. And that way, they could pass information down to their friends, family, neighbors. Sometimes, even in schools, there could be dramas in the theater. Dramas could also come in place to educate people because the role of education is inevitable in the fight against environmental sustainability. That's what we found out. Thank you very much, Dr. Wenoms. That has really been insightful. Then, Edwin, uh, my next question comes to you. Edwin, are you there? Yes, Edwin is here. Okay, Edwin, can you good. hear us? Okay. Edwin, please, I would like you to give us a parting word. Okay, that's good. I would like you to give a parting word to the audience watching us on their role on climate oh, change. Why climate change is actually okay. important to us is because we know that it's one of the greatest threats facing the world's children and their children. Mm -hmm. That's the future generation. So I would like us, I would like you to talk to the audience, tell us the role that they have to play. Because I think this issue of climate change to so a lot of people is still like an abstract thing. They don't get it. They don't understand why it is this generation that we're fighting climate change. So what happened all these years? Some see it as something that uh, it, it, it's not necessary. So please educate us on the role 
of individuals in tackling climate change. Thank you, Edwin. Okay, uh, thank you. I think uh, it starts with us to make, uh, if you want to create a change, let's be the change we want to see in our community. Uh, let me say, uh, let's use reusable bags for shopping. Let's also use uh, reusable bottles when taking water and avoid using plastics. Uh, let's save our electricity and also let's also depend on uh, the solar energy. Okay. So uh, when making these decisions, let's think about people who are going to live in this in this earth in the near future. Let's not okay. let's not think about only us. Let's also think about the people who are going to come after us. That's my message to the people out there. Okay, so Dr. Wayne-Oms, you're saying in everything that we do, we should be conscious of the climate. We shouldn't just think about this generation. We should not be selfish. We should rather think about the future generation because uh, we know that the, our actions of today will affect them. Thank yeah. you very much, Edwin. That was a very nice one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Dr. Wenom, Dr. I'll come back to you. Are you there? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. Okay, Dr. Wenom, please, looking at the at climate-related issues, what you're doing is still, it has to do with the environment, creating a green space, which of course we know it's a, it's a strategy. You know, when we have the green space, we can now have trees around so that the environment, in, we can inhale, of course our oxygen will be available to us and the trees will take in the carbon monoxide and all that. Okay, looking at that, we want to know what are the potential impacts of a uh, climate change, the imp potential impact of uh, air pollution. We are talking about pollution now. Now, I don't want to just limit it to air pollution, environmental pollution, let's say. Hmm. So here, both the air, the water, the land, they are all part of what I'm talking about. And also plastic pollution is part of it, that's the land pollution. So I want to know the if a potential impact of this on health, on human health. And I would want you to make special reference to children, especially as in regards to children. <laughs> because you're talking about the future generation, saving the space for them. So as in regards to children, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Adobe, for that question. So <laughs> I will try to summarize or I'll try to make it short. So um, okay. environmental impact, let's talk about, um, first of all, we'll start with chemical. So chemicals, we talk about heavy metals and toxins. Um, we do not pay so much attention to e-waste, but we have children who are scavengers. So I'll be mm. relating more to children. We have children who are scavengers, children who tiptoe barefooted in heaps of dirt, where you oh. see them looking for all those kinds of things where they pick and pick and pick. Recently, the e-waste was on the radar of the Conversation Africa. That's like a publication um, website. Mm -hmm. And it talked about that. But Nigeria doesn't pay attention to all those things. So imagine taking in mercury. There's a documentary in of Burkina Faso of the children trying to um, wash mercury so that, you know, for watches and gold and all those things, you could see the impact already in the small child that was crawling by where they were doing the mines for the mercury. So imagine even e-waste, the phones where they go and scavenge, that's a different bargain of what we are going to inhale, lead poisoning. Um, uh, we're going to have lead poisoning, you're going to have, um, what do you call this other one, mercury poisoning, which are very common. So that's going to have cognitive damage without us knowing. IQ will say, oh, the, the child is dull, the child is like this, the child has some kind of brain wave, but that is for chemicals. Again, because there's no safety about it, so anybody can assess it, anybody can do anything with it. Air pollution, I will give my place as an example. We have the refinery and River State Water Cuts. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's a visible place to talk about. It's a very visible case study. They don't they forgot it about the library and uh, they started, they forgot about all those riverine people, what the, the damages that happened, but oh well. When we talk about when we talk about air pollution, so I I stayed in a place or I used to stay in a place where we we're just by the refinery. They gave the gov the government built refinery there. So um over the years, whilst I practiced before I moved to the UK, you would see the increase in the number of respiratory problems. So asthma, um, cough, you would see a lot of that. When you wash your, your dress and you hang it, it's white dress. By the time you come back, it's black dress. So <laughs> that's the impact. Uh, for mothers, it is reducing the, 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 the child. It is reducing the size of the child in the womb. So it's causing what interuterine growth restrictions. So you're having smaller babies, premature babies. You are having infertility issues. You are having because of air pollution. Let's talk about uh, climate change, climate activities. We now have more natural disasters. Flooding is happening, more mosquito bites, more neglected tropical diseases. Schistosomatiasis is coming in place. We are now having things like, uh, what's this other one? Wash related neglected tropical disease. We have trachoma, we have river blindness. Government is doing um, campaigns, mass drug administration, but I asked the matron, why are you giving them this drug? And she's like, I don't know. They said we should give them the drug. So, <laughs> so we don't know the impact of climate change. We don't even know the impact of the mosquito that is biting us and causing elephant tears, it's very big legs. We don't know the, those are the impacts that is happening. Those are the impacts, reduce growth of a child, reduce brain size, small lungs of children. You're, because you are inhaling toxins, the size of the lungs becomes very small. Again, there you have microbes. We have all kinds of microbes. Because there's no water, because we have problems with water, we don't have good water. Lagos is a case study. We are so surrounded uh. by water, but we spend more than 250 billion in water sanitation and hygiene. We have open defecation. We are still doing open defecation. We are still having those kinds of things. So open defecation, no water, um, poor access to improved sanit sanitary facilities, open toilets. You then start having microbes. That's what you call E. coli, Escherichia coli. So your hands are touching these kind, different kind of places, and you are eating food as a small child. You are having diarrhea. Diarrhea is one of the top um, five killers for children. So you see, we are having a circle, but we think mm -hmm. our environment is not functioning. So that's the impact. Access to healthcare. So I have all this problem, but I know. I, let me speak in pidgin English. Forgive my foreigners. Which hospital I go go where they go treat me? Where will I go to and have hospital? <laughs> Lack of access. We are shouting universal health care. Oh my, not the universal health care coverage. There is no, you know, some communities do not have health care centers. So all those other things I mentioned, there's nowhere to treat them. So they get to die. So the WHO is busy counting the record for us. The number is increasing, both the recorded ones and the unrecorded ones. Infrastructure, poor road. Let's say there's health center, but I need two hours to get to the health center, or I need mm -hmm. to to get to the health center. Mm -hmm. Or something bad happens, like yesterday or two days ago in Worry, the tanker that parks on the main express fell down and burnt children, over wow. 16 children. So wow. any mishap can happen in Nigeria. So poor infrastructure, water quality, I'm a wash fan. We don't have water, so we have bad water, dirty water. So our, our, our streams, our rivers are all polluted. We are drinking deadly water. We have bad water. Niger Delta doesn't have clean water. We have exploration, destroying water. Lagos has polluted water. So different water, when they talk about water, it's, it's not just to open tap. No, it's not just to open tap. So you have kidney problems because of water, kidney stones. You are drinking hard water. You are drinking. So that's again for children, a lack of access to water, lack of wash facilities in school, cognitive reasoning, um, as well-being is just destroyed for them so it's a big thing and the environment impacts a lot on them <sighs> thank you very much dr <laughs> Williams. you've made you've done justice to this it's actually a very big problem because the issue of contaminated water yes like you talked about diarrhea is actually the second leading cause of death in children it's that bad and everything goes down to food, water, contamination. Thank you very much, Dr. Wenelms.
Okay, uh, Dr. Wenoms, uh, just a quick one before we close. Uh, you said something about living close to, I think, to a mining area. Refinery, yes. Yeah, refinery. So I don't know, is that what sport you're interested in? So I know you work with Timadi. So is that is that the link? Yeah, and so I'm from the Niger Delta. I'm a proper Niger Delta woman. Yeah, um, we see. I, my village, my village is when my father used to take us to the river. You would see the, you would see the oil in the water. Hmm. You would see everything. So that spot, as I progressed in med school, as I progressed, I was like, there's something about this environment that is related to us. Let us really, really look at. So that was where my interest actually came in. Sorry, you have another candidate. <laughs> <laughs> Can we say hi to him? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Minos. Thank you. Ah, it's really been an insightful section. We've really learned, learned a lot. It's been an eye opener for us here. We've gotten, we've talked about so many issues as, re, as it relates to ecofeminism climate change, flooding, diseases in children as a result of lack of access to good water. We've all our panelists have done justice to the topics we've discussed. And just a little addition to our audience watching us, it's obvious that the issue of climate change and environmental sustainability is an issue that requires a collective effort. We all have a role to play no matter how little it is, down to making sure you dispose the pet bottles properly, to keeping the water, not polluting the water. Of course, in villages, even those in the, even the indigenous people, you know, one thing about indigenous people is that they contribute so little to greenhouse gases emission, but they are the most affected because of their way of life. It's linked to the natural environment. So even them in the streams, instead of polluting the water, from one end and another person goes to the other end to fetch it. And of course, leading to diarrhea and cholera, they also have a role to play. Those in the cities, in the urban areas, we have a role to play. Proper disposal of waste to, evolve, to the, ensure that we don't have environmental pollution. Then when it has to the issue, come to the issue of advocacy, like Dr. Wenom says, said in what she was saying, education, education is key. We're driving it down to like the, the case of the world largest lesson that came in, trying to drive in the SDGs down into the school curriculums to know if government can adopt sustainability to be part of education, because that's a major way that children can be taught in school. And of course, you know that when these children are taught properly in school, they will extend down the message messages to their family, friends, and neighbors. So it's really been a very nice session having it. And of course, adaptation. Adaptation is key in the fight against the climate change. We look for ways to adapt. There are various interventions that, are, that have been come up. And uh, we could be through distribution of posters. It could be dramatization. It could be so many things. And I love what uh, Edwin said when he had to when he came to the issue of what government they've done so far. They've really done a lot. He talked about the issue of uh, having a camp like the, dis the displaced persons, like in Nigeria we have the IDP camp where people that are displaced as a result of one form of natural disaster or another. And he said that in Uganda there's something like that too, having a camp. I know that in the past various world governments they've done something in, in regards to mitigation. Where we, talk, where we have the Doha Amendment and the Kyoto Protocol and all that, the Paris Agreement, but bringing it down, you know, the SDGs, we're now trying to localize it, bringing it out to our local community, like what Dr. Wenoms is saying, in Niger Delta, all these issues and things that can be done. In conclusion, what we are saying is that we all have a role to play. To our audience watching us, we all have a role to play. And we should please, no matter how little it is, we should all play our role. Then from all of us at EFA, that's Engage Africa Foundation, we are still on the panel on the importance of caring for the environment to improve our health. And it's really, it has really been an insightful session. We say a very big thank you to all our panelists, to Edwin, to Dr. Wenoms, to Jennifer. You've all done justice to this. And to others watching us, we say thank you for listening to us. And 
I Osaze for myself, Adobe Wu and Osaze, we say thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank you much. Everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Jennifer. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Edwin. Bye. Bye.